Hey guys, it's Ash, and welcome back to the library. This time I'm going over what I've read in the month of April, so I'm still a little late, but a little bit less late, at least. So I read three different books in the month of April, so let's just go ahead and get into it. Book number one, Dreaming in Cuban by Christina Garcia. Before I really start getting into this novel, I feel like I should mention there are several trigger warnings you should be aware of. I'm not actively going to talk about these things, but just in the event that you want to read this novel, you should be aware that there are depictions of rape, of general violence, of political violence, suicide attempts, murder attempts against a child specifically. There is also some scenes of basically a psychotic break, there's a lot of depression, and there's also death. So if any of that is going to trigger you in general or trigger you at this particular point in time, I suggest taking caution when it comes to reading this. So moving on from that, Dreaming in Cuban is a really interesting novel, not just because of the subject matter, but because of the way it's written. It's kind of a story within a story. Um, Garcia is extremely clever with how she writes her chapters. So not only are they switching character perspectives, but they're also switching from narration styles. So the majority of the novel is told in a third person narration, but several of the characters get first person points of views throughout this. And it's really kind of interesting if you note which characters have been granted first person and when they're granted first person. The novel not only shifts character perspectives, but it also, again, shifts from the narrators. And it follows an entire family, um, starting with their grandmother and going down to the youngest child, basically. So it tells the entire family's story as a whole, all within the course of this one novel, as well as threading it back into relevant political events and that sort of thing, because this novel is set farther back than right now. I believe it's in the 80s, uh, but don't quote me on that. The novel occurs both in Cuba and also in America. It kind of shows the struggle of finding where you belong, especially for the, I think there's only one Cuban-American character in here, um, a daughter who was born in America and grew up here. And so it, it shows her struggle to belong and to kind of make a choice within her family of, of which side she was on. And again, with the political climate of the story being what it was, that was a big and weighty decision that was really pressing down on her. Garcia's characters are really, really well done. They're very lifelike, they're very compelling, and so her novel as a whole really invites you into these people's lives. And among other things that it invites you into is that Garcia's novel includes a more in-depth and personal look into Santeria than what you can find kind of in general, which for those of you interested uh, is a very, a very neat little inside look because uh, for those of you who don't know, Santeria is a religion that was a combination between Catholicism and traditional African religions that kind of blend together. Um, something along the lines you could think of would be voodoo or hoodoo, either one of those would be another blending of religions that give you the same idea. None of them are the same thing, but if that helps you understand what it is, then that's what it is. But she does offer a little bit more of an inside look into Santeria, into the um, the, the structure within the religion as well as different initiation rites and that sort of thing. It doesn't really go into the rituals much, which is understandable because there's not much known about them, but it does give you a little bit more of an inside look than what you can generally find on your own. I, I really enjoyed this novel, actually. Um, it's one that I might have picked up on my own, but I'm not entirely sure. It's a really interesting read from how it's written to the story it's telling. And it's not a, a difficult novel to get through. It's pretty entertaining, pretty snappy. It is a very strong and powerful novel, though. It leaves an impact on you, which I, I enjoy. You know, I like a light, casual read every now and then, but I want the words to really mean something. You know, feel me? Anyway, 
So I would recommend this quite a bit. It was a very good novel, very interesting, and had a lot of differences that you don't normally find. Anyway, so this first one. Moving on to the next. Book number two, My Year of Meats by Ruth Ozeki. And before I tell you anything about this, there's several trigger warnings for this novel that you should be immediately aware of, including sexual assault, rape, attempted rape, eating disorders, miscarriages, and domestic violence. And these are, some of those are heavily delved into within this novel and extremely depicted. So please be aware of that before you pick up this novel. This is an extremely heavy-hitting novel. It's kind of one of those that you finish and then you find yourself staring at the wall for a while because you're just not sure what you should do. <laughs> it, it really leaves a massive impact on you. We follow the stories of Jane, a Japanese-American woman, and Aikiko, a Japanese woman. Now, Jane is a producer and director of a TV show, a Japanese TV show, called My American Wife, which is being put on and created by the American meat industry in the story. Jane is a very strong-willed, independent woman, uh, while her counterpart, Aikiko, is a kind of a traditional Japanese housewife who is struggling with living her own life instead of just the life her husband has set out for her. Jane takes to the roads for My American Wife, and every week the show puts out an episode about an American wife who cooks whatever her number one recipe is, so long as it has meat, and basically shows off her picturesque family. Somewhere along the way, though, Jane decided that these depictions are not the only way to show off a family or an American family. And so she starts switching it up and throwing in different families that would be considered non-traditional, such as a lesbian couple and their children, or a Mexican couple who moved to America and had become citizens, or a picturesque family who just adopted kids from all over the place, giving them a really, really big, expansive, and diverse family. All of these people weren't necessarily what the Japanese television company thought was perfect, but Jane wanted to depict families. And along the way, Jane uncovers and discovers quite a bit about the meat industry. So that is also featured heavily within this novel and understandably can be rather disturbing. It kind of follows Jane's journey in trying to produce a documentary actually talking about the dangerous things that she stumbled across in her her research for My American Wife. On Aikiko's side, we have a, a woman who finds a way to come into her own, who ends up just becoming her own person and doing whatever she it is that she pleases, which is a very powerful and uplifting story in its own right. In combination with Jane's life, the flipping back and forth between them, it kind of gives you a new perspective on both sides of this world that are shown. My Year of Meats. Gosh, I... <laughs> I don't really know what to say. I would highly recommend this um, just because of the power and the impact that this novel has on you as a person. It is not a light read. Um, I think all the massive amounts of warnings that I've given you tell you it's not a light read and it really, really isn't. It is a very, very heavy novel, very, very impactful. But it is surprisingly mostly enjoyable. The depictions of some of the violence, graphic violence, that show up in here are, are extremely disturbing um, and, you know, very, very far from enjoyable. But there's also the characters themselves are, are witty and fun and you find yourself bonding to them very quickly and rooting for them and their own personal struggles. So yeah, it's it's one heck of a ride. <laughs> um, 
I think if you're feeling brave, you should definitely check it out because it is well worth the read. Just be prepared coming into it and be aware that there is some heavy depictions that are going to be in here. Anyway, number three, Josephine by Josephine Baker and Joe Bouillon. So this is an autobiography of Josephine Baker, who, if you're not familiar with, was a huge star in the 1920s and kind of carrying forward. And a lot of people kind of just saw the glitz and glamour of Josephine, you know, what she had become in the spotlight and that sort of thing. But this offers a really in-depth look into her beginnings and into all the behind the scenes of all the glamour and the glitz that she had experienced. Josephine was a really interesting person and this was a fascinating book, honestly. She came to stardom by starting out in uh, her hometown of St. Louis, Missouri, where she came from nothing. She joined a, a show troupe at age 13 and just continued rising up the ranks all the way through until she came to Paris. And she came to Paris with a show called Le Revue Nigre, which was a group of African-American performers who gathered together to put on a show in Paris. Now, Paris at this time period was desperate for something new. They wanted something new, something exciting, something different, something they'd never seen before. And Josephine Baker and her fellow creators were certainly something different. And they took Paris by storm. They introduced stuff like the Charleston, jazz music, and a lot of African and African American culture into Paris, which just loved them. So Josephine fell in love with Paris and stayed there for her whole life, basically. And again, the behind the scenes from the glitz and glamour shows you her war days. During World War II, she served as a spy because she knew nobody would suspect the glamorous Josephine Baker. You know, this woman at one point walked to, a, what was it, a cheetah? Is it a cheetah or a leopard? I think it might have been a leopard on a diamond collar and leash, you know, just around the streets of Paris. You know, she, she was the absolute epitome of glitz and glamour. But there was a lot more to her than that. She served during that time in World War II under the French army and received several different awards for it, for her heroicism and for all the sacrifices that she made and all the uplifting things she did as well. She would perform for troops and just kind of trying her best to uplift spirits. But after World War II ended, Josephine found herself kind of at a loss. She was still performing, still doing everything that she loved, but it just didn't feel the same anymore after doing what she did for the war, after doing something that she felt really meant something. So Josephine chose a new fight. She was a huge, huge fighter against racism, especially in America, her home country. She refused to perform in America in front of segregated audiences, which led many different clubs and you know casinos and that sort of thing to actually ban their segregation policy in order to entice Josephine to perform for them, which was a humongous step within America, and especially during the time period that this was happening, which was what, the 60s, I think? Josephine's work against racism actually put her on the FBI's watch list for more than 50 years, just because she was doing things that, at the time, weren't particularly liked. Actually online, on the FBI's vaults um, page, they released their entire thing on Josephine Baker, all the information they had collected. Of course, most of, there's quite a bit of it that's redacted. But it's kind of an interesting thing to look through, that they kept so much stuff about her from just watching her all those years. But more, you know, to what she was actually doing. Uh, at the time that Martin Luther King Jr. died, she was offered the position to take over his spot, but she ended up turning it down because of her family, which her family alone was another way that she was fighting against racism. They were dubbed the Rainbow Tribe, and her and her husband, Joe, they adopted children from all over the world. So their family was filled with people from different countries and people of different races. 
and she used her family to show that the whole world could live in harmony. You know, if race isn't a dividing factor, it's how you treat it, how you view it, where her family is happy as could be. Everybody loved each other, everybody was a family, regardless of the fact that not everyone looked the same. And it served in the long run as a big talking point, especially during the time that all this was happening, because people realized what Josephine kind of wanted them to realize, that there really is no difference in the end. Her novel as a whole here is kind of interesting because it's not really written as a novel. A lot of it is is Josephine's words, but there's also, you know, little little inputs from her husband, from her sister, from her ch from her kids, from people she worked with, that sort of thing, just to try and round out the story. Because Josephine never actually completed this book. She kind of just wrote things down, things she wanted to put in, little ideas, little bits and pieces. And her husband put it together after her death. Which is kind of a neat concept because it does really round out the story so it's more than just Josephine's perspective. It's kind of everybody's. It can also be a little disorienting at times, just in the sense that you want to hear more of Josephine's story and you kind of end up getting quite a bit of other people's stories as well. But as a whole, I, I enjoyed it. I think Josephine is a very interesting and fascinating person, and I, I wish more was available about her time as a spy. Because it just, she did some unbelievable stuff, and just so much of it is, is glossed over even in this, because she just kind of viewed it as, you know, things that she did for her country, her adopted country. But I wish more of it was out there because it sounds <laughs> sounds fascinating. But yeah, this book, by the way, is, I don't believe it's in print anymore. However, in the link below, I will have a copy from Amazon put down there. This is where I got this one. It, um, they, so they are still out there even though they're not necessarily in print. But anyway, that's everything for the month of April. I'll have another one soon for the month of May on time, <laughs> this time. But yeah, there was an interesting, interesting group of books from the month of April. Definitely very different. But I hope you enjoyed, and I hope you guys check out some of these books. Uh, some of them only if you're feeling brave. <laughs> and I hope you let me know how you like them, or if you have any questions or any thoughts on them, anything like that, down in the comments below. And again, all the books will be linked in the description below as well. So thank you guys so much. If you enjoyed it, leave a like. Subscribe if you want to see the month of May's April reads on time. And I will see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.